If you are aspiring a career in IT, whether it is cloud, it is legacy traditional networking, or you are in software engineering, in development, in DevOps, in DevSecOps, GetOps, in whatever system administration, you need to learn Linux and you need to learn it now. This is the best course to have you learn that in less than three hours, master it and become confident with your Linux knowledge. So my name is Isa Abu Sharif and I have with me Mustafa El Shami. So let's get to know him because he would be doing most of the course. I am Mustafa and I'll be your instructor for this Linux Fundamentals video course. I worked for Dell Technologies as a senior technical support engineer for more than five years and I had a huge experience in managing and troubleshooting Linux based systems. I also hold two Red Hat certifications, RHCSA and RHCE, and I have five AWS certifications, including the Solutions Architect Professional Certificate. I have been delivering on-site training for three years already, and I have many people acquiring the RHCSA certification. I put everything I know in Linux in this course, including things I wish I knew earlier that would have helped me a lot in my job. If you never knew anything about Linux, this course is the best for you. Worth mentioning that Linux is like learning the alphabets of language. And by learning Linux, you land your foot in the world of IT and you'll be ready for many jobs. So this course can be a fresh start for you and your career. And it doesn't matter which background you come from. Let's start with IT fundamentals. Compute devices encompasses a lot of devices that we use on a daily basis. And that includes laptops, iPads, iPhones, mobile phones, servers, anything that has to do with processing that we use, which includes apps that we use on a daily basis. And although each one of them is used for a different use case, but they have a lot of things in common. And that's what we are trying to focus on in this lecture. So common components for computing devices include the CPU, the central processing unit. The central processing unit is considered like the brain, the main muscle in the computing device. And this is where all the instructions, all the input and output operations, data exchange, processing happens. And that is existing in every single device. And some devices, they could be powerful enough where they could have more than one CPU inside them. Then we have the RAM or the random access memory. This is where when you run one of your applications, it runs in the RAM. So for example, you are running Microsoft Word or PowerPoint, or you are using Google Chrome or using an email client, Outlook or whatever it is. Then when that file or that application starts, it runs in the random access memory or the RAM. Then we have the storage. Now I'm working on a PowerPoint file or a Microsoft doc file or an Excel sheet or I'm working on any type of data and now I need to save that file. Why do I save it? Because if the battery in the device runs out, maybe I'll lose the data. So I want to make sure that I save it so it will be there even if I switch off the device and I start it after one week or two weeks, I still have access to the data or the file that I was working on. And that's why we need a storage or a hard disk drive, or sometimes depending on the technology is called solid state drive as well, which are faster ones. Then we have the network cards or interfaces. When we connect at home and we are on Wi-Fi, how is that happening? How is that exchange happening between my phone and the Wi-Fi network at home? There is a built-in Wi-Fi adapter that facilitates that in your phone and also in the router at home. Similarly, if we have a server connected in a network, then that server needs to be cabled into the network. It needs to be a connect connected into the network. How? There is a network interface card. So the type of connectivity can be cabled or can be physical or can be Wi-Fi, wireless. Then we have the monitors. I mean, we look at, in, at the phone and then we can see a lot of things. This is your monitor, laptop. If you have a desktop at home and then you have a, a bigger screen, 
these are all monitors even the tv at home it has the cpu it has the input output and it has the interface for the network either wi-fi or wired and it does have a monitor because its function is to display movies and uh, shows and stuff like that for you then we have the graphic cpu or the gcpu this is in case if we have a device that does a lot of rendering videos and processing videos and editing videos and movies and stuff like that then it's better to have a dedicated card called the gcpu because it accelerates the processing of graphics or graphic related content one thing very important we need to learn is what is an operating system linux is an operating system but also microsoft windows is an operating system mac devices they have their own our phones they have either ios or android operating system so what is a, an operating system and why do we need it the operating system is basically the mediator between the applications and the actual device so if this is a laptop without the operating system you cannot have microsoft windows you cannot have powerpoint you cannot have your calendar you cannot have your email these applications will not be installable on your device without the operating system so that's the one that will understand the applications and also will understand the hardware or the actual device components and then it can translate between them the operating system manages the application and software it manages the memory that you have on the computing device be it a phone a printer a wireless router a computer and a tablet an ipad whatever it is and the hardware the physical uh, components themselves the processes that are required to have everything work in harmony and in charm and also the input and output if you want to send something to the outside to the internet it has to go through the wi-fi component on your device and then it goes out if you want to print something then it has to go through the wi-fi to the printer if you would like to use the camera if you'd like to use the keyboard all of these are periphery devices external devices that needs to interact with the hardware who is the coordinator for all of that that's the operating system why do we need it because we cannot use our devices without having an operating system installed because our applications are not going to be installable or even functional without it so the operating system is the most important component of software that you have on your device and of course as we mentioned multiple times the applications they need that what are examples of operating systems that we definitely either have heard about or we are using them of course you're looking at Linux as an operating system and that's what we are going to discuss here we have Windows and we have Mac as well that's on the computers and servers how about the mobile devices how about the phones and all that then we have Android and we have iOS from Apple so this is if you have a Samsung phone or if you have any other brand of phones then android is going to be the operating system if it is an apple device then ios is going to be the system so we are using operating systems without even knowing why it is so important and why we need to learn it the operating system sits between the physical device and the applications and that's how it works then the operating system must be there and you get the choice based on what exactly is the need what are the applications are the application installable on windows do they need windows or linux are they installable here and there so that all has to happen and if you would like to put that in an image we have the computing hardware so that's the memory the speakers the microphone the monitor the mouse the keyboard the networking devices the camera and so on and then we have the applications chrome for example youtube you need to run uh, powerpoint you'd like to use outlook and other email applications and so on and so forth then you need an operating system it could be a mac it could be a linux it could be a windows and that's the coordinator the one that understands 100 percent what's happening on the hardware side and what's happening on the software side so any application including the operating system we call it software these are programs developed to do their function whereas anything else that we can physically see and touch that is the hardware or the computer hardware operating systems they could have 
different interfaces. So the one we are mostly used to is the GUI interface or the graphical user interface. And we use that on our phones. We use it on our Windows machines and also on our Mac OS machines or Mac machines. We can touch if it is a touch screen or we can use the mouse to click and so on. So it is something that graphical and it is colorful and we interface with the device and applications and all that through these colorful icons. And that's what we do. Linux is not like that. Linux is a command line interface. Can we have a uh, browser installed on a Linux machine? Of course you can. But what we are saying is Unix heavily depends on using the command line. And we have terminals and we're going to discuss that in detail. And then we start typing commands like date, for example, then you have the date uh, printed for whenever that command is deployed or is implemented. We can achieve a lot of what we can do with the graphical user interface. We can install applications, we can run them, we can kill them, we can stop them, we can delete them. We can do a lot in the command line interface on Linux. So we need an operating system and we need Linux because that's the future, whether you are in cloud, in DevOps, in machine learning, in AI, in development, in programming, in software testing, software engineering, computer engineering, whatever the field that you are choosing or you are in already, you need to master Linux. This is not a luxury anymore. This is a requirement and you must have it. And this video is going to give you all of that. All right. Now let's talk about servers. What is a server and what do we mean by a physical server? So when you listen to that term or you hear it, you know what we are talking about. So a server basically is where we put the applications. It's a muscle computing device that can process much faster. It can serve multiple requests from many clients at the same time without sweating and losing breath. That's basically what the server is. So can I use my laptop as a server? Yeah, maybe if the users that are going to use it will be five at a time or six or 10 at a time, maybe you can get away with using a laptop or an iPad or something and then putting some application users can log into. But if you are talking about amazon.com, ebay.com, cnn.com, I mean these big websites, then we cannot get away with a weak or a mini computing device, many in terms of muscles in terms of CPU, in terms of power and all that. So the server basically is a powerful computing device that could have multiple CPUs. It will have a good sized memory and it will have one or more disk drives to store data. Of course, it needs a bigger space and a bigger size to do that. It can have one or more network interfaces and it can have one or more GCPUs. So same components in principle, but now the quantities or the sizing of these components is different and higher. To work with the server, then you have these components we discussed, but also you need to install an operating system in the most part or in the most cases. You have an operating system, Windows or Linux or Mac OS, and then you can start application on top of that. So the server itself is a piece of hardware that you need some software on it to run. So the software is your operating system and it can be your applications and so on. And of course, when it comes to a muscle server or a powerful server, then we are talking about something or a device that can serve hundreds or ten or thousands or tens of thousands or maybe more of clients or users that will be accessing that game or that application on the server. When we talk about the CPU, the measuring unit for the CPU or how we specify whether uh, that a CPU is powerful or not is in terms of gigahertz. And of course, the generation as well. I mean, you have generation nine and you have an Intel or AMD, you have different types of CPU manufacturers and also different series or generation within each one. The memory and storage, they are measured in gigabytes or gigabytes. And the network interface card speed is measured in megabits per second or gigabits per second. Now let's cover an important concept, which is virtualization. So what we discussed in the previous lecture was physical servers. Now we are talking about virtualization. Is there a way if my server and the applications on it are underutilizing its resources? Is there a way I can have multiple virtual servers on top of the physical server? Why would you do that? Better use of resources. 
and maybe I need to run Linux server and Windows server on the same physical one without having to acquire a new one. So what we discussed so far is when we have a physical server, then we'll have the components which are called the hardware, and then we have the operating system and applications which are called the software. Now, what if I need to run an application that requires Linux operating system, not Windows, and I need to run it on the same server? So in that case, we have to go for what we call virtualization. So virtualization is in the simple terms, dividing your server virtually, logically into multiple servers. Each one of them is going to be separate and isolated from the others and each one of them can have its own guest operating system or operating system on its own and it can have its own op uh, applications also on top of that operating system. So I'm, we might have a virtualized servers where we have a Red Hat Linux virtual machine or virtual server next to a Windows virtual server next to an Ubuntu Linux operating system server and each one of them will have its own applications installed on top of that okay how can i manage to do that how can this server access the outside world how can they get to the storage how can they get to the outside in terms of wi-fi or in terms of connection to the network and then to the internet for example how can the clients from the outside access a specific server and not the others this is through what we call a hypervisor so we have a software layer on the server that will be installed and that software layer is going to be the facilitator of providing each virtual server its own requirements of memory, desk, CPU, GCPU, network interfaces and so on. And at the same time, it will know if the traffic is coming from the outside to this server, how to communicate with that server and how to get the response back to the client. Similarly with the other servers. So the hypervisor is an emulation layer that will make every one of these virtual machine feel and be convinced that it has whatever it needs from desk and memory and CPU and all that so the application and operating system can be installed successfully. So virtualization enables us to run more than one virtual system, multiple operating systems and complete isolation on the same physical server. Okay. And the hypervisor, as we mentioned, it used the virtual instances of the hardware to create virtual machines. So basically what we are doing is we are sharing the hardware on the physical server logically among the different virtual machines that we have. And on a server, we can have 10, 20, 50, 60 virtual machines working, functioning, and each one of them will be happy performing whatever it is required or it is supposed to do without any issues, okay? Now, how many can I put? Is there a guideline? It all depends on how strong and powerful the original server is, because now you are sharing its own hardware and all that, so you don't want them all to oversubscribe and demand more than what the server has at all the time in terms of memory and storage and CPU and all that, then you will have a problem, or that means you have overutilized or have abused the capacity of virtualization that you can have on this server. Now, when I have a virtual machine, the physical server was easy to remove from one location because I can touch it and feel it and then port it or lift it into another location. I can do that. But what, what about the virtual machines? When you want to have a virtual machine moved from one place to the other, or maybe you just need to have a backup of that virtual machine just in case, because that is software. If a problem happens, then you can restore your virtual machine and the services on top of it or the applications on top of it. Then you can have a file that will be the backup of your complete virtual machine. So that means if you want to install it on a different server, all you need to do is to take that file and then install it on the other one, on the other server that has the same hypervisor or compatible hypervisor. Same thing for the Windows, same thing for the other Linux. So you can always have a snapshot or a backup and that will be what you need to restore it on a different server if you want. So the virtualization components now for the virtual machines, each one will have its own operating system, its own applications, but also each one of them will be told by the hypervisor that you have this much 
of CPUs in a virtual format. So basically you are sharing this much of the CPUs from the physical server and you are sharing or you are being allocated this much of memory, virtual memory from the original memory. Linux is a free and open source operating system so anyone can have the code, modify it, and then deploy it and share it. However, Windows is a commercial operating system and even if you buy it, you won't have the access to its source code. Linux comes with different distributions that are built for specialized purposes. However, Windows have very customization options available. Linux is a developer-friendly operating system and heavily depends on a command line interface. On the other hand, Windows is a user-friendly operating system as it's based on the graphical user interface. Linux might be relatively complicated to install. However, it implements complex tasks fast and this is due to the fast nature of the Linux operating system. If the hardware is the same, a Linux operating system will run faster than Windows. In Linux, users have full control over the updates, so a user can install or update a program at any time without a reboot. Unlike Windows, updates can happen at any random time, including times when you work on something. Linux is more secure than Windows. In Linux, hackers or developers may find it difficult to hack a Linux system. Unlike Windows, which is the major target for hackers due to its large user base and its vulnerability without antivirus software, that's why corporate organizations tend to use Linux-based servers for their applications for security purposes alongside the other advantages. In this course, we are going to use virtualization environment will be the EC2 service on AWS. AWS EC2 is a compute service from Amazon Web Services that will allow you to get a ready-to-use Linux virtual machine. This has the advantage that you are going to get some experience with AWS. So how can we do that? First, we'll create an account on AWS. Then from EC2 service, you select an instance from the free tier and use the Linux operating system. Then you'll connect to your machine from the comfort of your laptop or online. Okay, so let's create our first AWS account. So in the sign up page for AWS, the first step is to choose an email. So I type in my email and then it asks me about a, a, a strong password. So I provided a strong password, but actually it looks like it doesn't contain non-alphanumeric characters. So I added one and then I repeated that step again. And then uh, I choose my AWS account name. So that takes me to next step, which is uh, choosing uh, the AWS account plan, whether it's going to be business or personal. Um, this course will be within the free tier. So we'll choose personal and then we'll fill out um, the, the whole form. So that actually would take, uh, take as to step three, which is the billing information. They ask you about uh, uh, credit or debit card details. Uh, and so I provided my uh, credit card details and don't worry, it won't charge you anything, just one USD or one euro for verification. So it's, it's totally safe. Um, so after verifying your credit card, that would take you to step four, which is the um, identity so in my case i'm based at cairo so i choose the country name or the country code to be egypt and then continue filling out filling it out so last step will ask you about um, the support plan which support plan we're going to use this course will be again uh, in the free tier so we'll choose the basic the basic support However, there are other support plans for developer and business support, which is for uh, big enterprises or individual developers and so on. 
So basically, in, in, in this course, all you need is uh, the basic support. Maybe later you can upgrade, but we'll use the basic support for now. And then last step is uh, completing sign up. And for now, AWS, we just created our, our, our AWS account. So basically, you can go to the AWS Management Console and start logging in. After we've created our first account on AWS, so this is basically the dashboard or the AWS Management Console that you're going to see. If you are new to AWS, you're not going to see anything from the recently visited. It's going to be empty. So now we want to create an instance on the cloud or a virtual machine on the cloud or like a computer that we can use anytime on the cloud. So this is very easy, very simple. We have to search for the EC2 service. It's one of the most popular services on AWS. If you have visited before, you can click on it. If you'd like to search for it, all you need to type is EC2 and you will going to find it to find it. Also, you can go there from services, compute, EC2, and click on it. Then we're going to click on launch instance. I'm going to provide a name for it. So for example, Linux instance for practice. And I'm going to choose the distro or in AWS language, the Amazon machine image or the image. I'm going to use Amazon Linux too. And of course, feel free to use um, some other Linux distros. For example, we have Red Hat already and it's free tier eligible. That means that you're not going to pay anything for using it. And uh, we have SUS Linux, Debian and so on. But I'm going to stick for Amazon Linux too. Um, and then I'm going to leave everything as it is in the T2 micro if you are on the Frankfurt region. And for the key pair, if you are new to EC2, just click on create a new key pair and I'm going to name it Dolphin. And then I'm going to click on create key pair. And that's it. I'm going to leave create security group and allow SSA traffic from anywhere. One last thing is to go down to advanced details and expand it and go all the way down to the user data box. In this box, there is an attachment and at the beginning of the course, and I may leave it as well in this video. And this attachment called user data, it's a text file, and this is the content of it. I'm going to update this every now and then. And regardless of what you see at the moment, all you need to do is just select all, copy and paste it under the user data. And that's it. And things will make sense and you'll understand it later in this course and an upcoming course of AWS. So now we are done with preparing our first EC2 instance or our first VM. And all we need to do is click on launch instance. And I will go to view all instances. And this is the instance that I have just created, Linux instance for practice. I'm going to refresh. And here we go. Now it's running. So how to connect to it, how to get a terminal to start practicing Linux commands. So I'm going to click on this one, select it and connect. And I'm going to click on connect. So now we have the terminal, so I can zoom in if I want better visibility. And now I can switch to root by sudo su. And now I can start practicing the Linux commands, for example, and learn Linux the easiest way possible. If you are not able to connect to this instance, you get an error like fail to connect to EC2. Just go to uh, the instance one more, more and more time and then go to security and click on security groups and go to the inbound rules and go to edit inbound rules and just make sure that you have SSH from the drop down menu and the source is custom and um, the 0.0.0 slash .0, .0, 0 from everywhere and save rules and it's going to work fine with you. 
So now we are ready to practice Linux on EC2 instance on AWS. A very common question that we get, should I use an Oracle VirtualBox and have virtual machines on my laptop? Or should I use a cloud-based Linux machine? If you ask me, I would recommend the second one, and that's what we have adopted in this course. However, you will find some videos that are in an Oracle virtual box. If you can, and you have a credit card, and you can register an account on AWS, you will get a free 12 months, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for one machine that you can use. So if you follow along and use that, when you are done, just stop the instance or terminate it and restart again. I would recommend doing this because this is what you will do in real life. It is much faster than installing VirtualBox and going into the different, uh, how can I use the mouse? How can I copy and paste? I cannot copy and paste. I need this driver. I need this setting. And maybe it's not working. I cannot install the virtual machine. I cannot create it. I stopped it, but it, and you have to back up every now and then to, to maintain everything. In AWS or on AWS, you don't need that at all. And that's what we recommend. And we have made sure that all the commands that are in the course, or I would say 99% at least, because it might be that you may find a command that is not 100% compatible, but it's going to be there. So if you have a credit card and you can create an account in AWS, go for it. If not, please let us know in the comment, comments down below. And we are going to give you a link for a video on how to do it on VirtualBox. But that will be another maybe a couple of hours, three hours of effort that you will have to take until that is installed. All right. So AWS is the way to go. That's what you will do on the job. And it's better to get used to it from now. What's Linux? I'd like to answer this question by asking another question, which is, what isn't Linux? Linux is embedded in everything in our lives. You interact with Linux operating systems every day when you open an e-commerce website or social media application through the World Wide Web. And that's because most of the websites are hosted on very specialized computers that we call servers. And these servers work on Linux-based operating systems. Think of it as our user-friendly laptops in which we use user-friendly Microsoft Windows operating systems to do our simple jobs. Linux is an operating system for computers that are usually used to support web hosting or storage solutions or even big data applications. Worth mentioning that Linux manages systems for the world stock markets, powered smart devices, and most of the top 500 supercomputers in the world. Linux also powers the cloud revolution and supports the tools for building containers, which is a booming technology. All that I have mentioned at this point tell us that Linux is a critical technology for IT enthusiasts to learn and understand. And from my point of view, I believe that Linux is the alphabet of IT. You learn Linux and then you can learn anything else in IT. Finally, if you are looking for a fresh start in IT, Linux is a high demand skill nowadays and lots of companies seek to hire Linux administrators. Why Linux is a great technology? First, Linux is open source software and by open source, we mean that anyone can use, study, modify and share the source code of the software. The output of this is more collaboration, sharing, transparency, and rapid innovation among the developers to improve the software. Think of it as it's a game that you, as a developer, can have its source code and just update it to include new levels and just share it with your friends. It's as simple as that, and this is one important reason why Linux is a great technology. The second important thing is that Linux is a modular operating system that allows developers to add, replace, or remove components. With that, a company or a developer may add something to make Linux general purpose workstation or make it an extremely specialized software appliance that achieves a certain objective. For example, 
Some storage vendors just use Linux to add some modules and some functionalities so that it's directed to deliver storage services. The third and last reason is a powerful command line interface. And we'll see that throughout the entire course. Linux was built in a way that users can perform all system administration tasks through the CLI. By using CLI, it's super fast, super effective, and super easy to automate, deploy, and provision your application and make system administration so simple compared to the graphical user interface option. We'll see throughout the course that we can implement tasks by typing a few characters with a keyboard. There are more reasons to answer this question, but we just have mentioned the most relevant ones. So when did this start? In 1991, a smart computer science student at the University of Helsinki called Linus Torvalds started a project that turned out to be the Linux kernel. And the kernel is the core component of the operating system, which manages hardware, memory, and scheduling of running programs. Linus Torvald has written a program by himself for the purpose of using his own hardware and use the function of his hardware processor independently of an operating system. But Linux kernel on its own is of no use. So Linux had to join the GNU project, and by then the kernel was supplemented with open source software like MIT's X Windows system, SendMail mail server, Apache HTTP web server, and other components. All these were added together to complete an open source Unix-like operating system. As time passes, it started to be challenging to assemble pieces from many sources with the Linux kernel. Therefore, Linux developers started to gather pre-built and tested tools and components inside an operating system and call it a distribution, short for a distro, so that users can download distribution to set up a Linux system quickly. And now, many different Linux distributions exist. Each distribution has a distinct purpose and goal. For example, some developers may gather components on the Linux kernel to provide a distro for general purposes like CentOS, or maybe a distro can be used for a single purpose like privacy and security like Parrot OS. The provider of the distribution must support that software, and typically there is a community for the developers who develop that distro. Examples of many Linux distros like Red Hat Enterprise Linux, Fedora, Ubuntu, and there are many, many other distros. So, what's the terminal? The terminal or the console is a program that allows us to accomplish and automate tasks on a computer without the use of a graphical user interface. Meaning, for a simple example, in Windows, to open a Word document located in a folder, you will use your mouse or touch screen to go to the Word document location. And then you'll click on it, right? With the terminal, you will open a Word document in one command or a set of commands without using the mouse or the graphical user interface. In Windows, we call this program command prompt. And in Linux, the program is called terminal. Okay, so when you open the terminal, you run commands to do a certain task. However, the commands you run always belong to a certain group that we call shell. So basically, shell provides a Linux command line, which is a text-based interface, used to input instructions to a computer system. In the screenshots, we can see two examples of shells. The upper screenshot represents bash commands which do not include the command print. However, at the bottom, the print command is recognized. Bash is the default and most common shell used in Linux system administration for many distributions like Red Hat or CentOS. The Bash shell is similar in concept to the command line interpreter found in recent versions of Microsoft Windows. Although Bash has a more sophisticated scripting language, it's also like Windows PowerShell in Windows 7. Using Bash to execute commands can be powerful, 
the Bash shell provides a scripting language that can support the automation of tasks. Back in the lecture, we said that the terminal is the program that allows us to run commands. In Windows, it's called PowerShell, or maybe we can do it with command prompt. In Linux, the frequent term we use is just the terminal. And terminals actually are different. They can go from a very basic one that doesn't have or doesn't support any colors or any fonts all the way to very powerful terminals that we can do many things with it. For example, a very basic one is putty. A very advanced one is the mobile term. And now we have our terminal here on AWS. It's called the easy to instance connect. So it's a web terminal. It's very easy, very straightforward, and we can do actually cool stuff with it. So let's get started. So what can I do with this terminal? First thing, if this is too far from you, maybe we can zoom in. So all I need to do is go to the three dots at the right hand side and just click on the plus sign. And now it provides better visibility. What else can I do? I can change the coloring of this terminal. So how can I do that? This is by using the set term command, and this is the very first command that we're going to use in set term coming from set terminal. And for example, if I want to use a green color, I will use dash four as in foreground, and I will just pick green. And now I can see font color has changed to green. So what if I wanted bold? So I can just add dash bold. And if I want this, so I will just add on and I'll click enter. And now the color is bold, the font is bold and the color is green, which gives better visibility. So what if, for example, I want to write in a red font with a white background. So it's very simple. We follow the same approach. So term four is going to be red. And for example, I want that on a white background. So back is going to be white and I will click enter and it's pretty much the same idea. So I can clear and now the entire terminal has changed to background and um, red font. However, for better visibility for the entire course, I'd like to just to stick to the green foreground with bold on and the background is going to be default, which is black. I know it's black, but I just use the default, which is, for example, this background color, which close to black. So I will clear, and now I'm ready to just start running my commands and learn the difference between the shell and bash. So what is the shell? The shell is a group of predefined commands. The default shell is called the bash shell. There are other shells, like the corn shell, which I can install on my system by running the command. So I'll type su and then the password. Okay, and yum install ysh. Okay, so now we have both the bash shell and the corn shell. So let's see the difference between both shells. For example, now I am at the bash shell. I can run the command echo. Hello world. And run the command print. Hello world. You will see there is an error with the print command as it's not found in the bash shell, okay? However, if I switch to the corn shell by running case h and then run both commands again, so echo, hello world, again, and print, hello world. So you'll see the print command is recognized here and it can be found and can be run without any issues in the corn shell. That was a basic example to get an idea of the shells and shells are something that can be developed. 
meaning at a high level, I can develop my commands and put them in a shell and name it like dolphin shell. So you get the idea. Finally, I believe you are a little bit familiar with bash. Think of it as a command line interpreter that's similar in concept to the PowerShell in Windows. Bash has a powerful sophisticated script language and can support the automation of tasks. Commands entered at the shell prompt have three basic parts. First, the command, like date, cat, echo, and we'll see them later in the hands-on. Second, the options that we can use to adjust the behavior of the command, dash n, dash r, which differs from a command to command. The third and last part is the argument, which is the input to the command that will be used to get the output. We have four examples. The first is the command date, which I can use without any option or argument, and it works. The second example is the same command date, but with one option in a format, and it also works. The third example is a command to print what's next to it, which is the echo command. And I put hello world as an argument. The last example is the command tail, which views the last 10 lines of a file. I use the option dash n to specify the number of files I want to view, and I put the target file path at the first argument. Don't get confused about these commands, we'll see them in detail in the hands-on video. I just want to give you a high-level idea about how commands can be run. In this slide, we can see four important commands, which are commonly used to view any file. And I use the slash etc slash password file as an example, and for talking about it later, the, this file contains the data of all users in the system. To view the file in the terminal, we can run cat slash etc slash password. If we are only interested to view the first 10 lines, we can run head slash etc slash password. If we'd like to view only the last 10 lines, we can use tail slash etc slash password. Finally, if we want to navigate through the file with arrows and use some research mechanism, we can use less slash etc slash password. Okay, so let's run some commands in the Linux terminal. First of all, we discussed that the structure of the syntax of the command consists of command with options and possibly several arguments. For example, we can run the command date. And you can see it displays the current date time value. We can run it this way or we can run it with some options. So how we can get an idea of the available options, we can type date dash dash help. So after running this, we can see we can run the command using all these options with these format. For example, we can run the command with plus and percentage or capital. So it displays the hour and minutes. So let's try this. So date plus percentage R. And we can run date plus percentage x and you can see it displays only the date so the date command is an example of a command that doesn't have any arguments we'll move to the command echo which takes one argument so basically you type echo and it prints what comes next to it so echo hello world and it prints hello world one more example is the file command so this command as well it takes one argument and it's used to identify the type of the argument so when i type file slash etc slash password it tells me it's an ASCII text, 
However, when I type file slash etc, it tells me it's a directory. Speaking of files, let us go quickly on some super important commands. If I want to view an entire file, we can use the command cat. So for example, cat slash etc slash password. So it prints out everything inside the file. If I want to view the first lines of the same file, we can use head slash etc slash password. And these are the only first lines. If I want to view the last 10 lines of the same file, we can use tail slash etc slash password. Now the question is, what if I need to view only the last five lines instead of 10 lines? I will wait for, I, for five seconds so that you can challenge yourself. Yes, exactly. If you don't know, if you only know that tail is used to print out the last lines, you can type tail dash dash help. And after we're going through the options, okay, so basically this is the way it's run. So you provide options and then you provide the file. So after going through the options, you can see that dash n is the option we want. It outputs the last number of lines instead of the last 10. So this is the option. So again, I clear it and then tail dash n number of lines, I'll type 5 slash etc slash password. And here we go. So the last command we are going to run in this hands on will be the command that takes two arguments, like the copy command, which we'll discuss later in detail in module four. To copy a file, we'll need to run the cp command and specify the location or the path of the file at the first argument and the destination path as the second argument. So here we go. cp etc password and another in the same di directory, password2. Okay, so now we are in Dolphin, so I'll switch user to, I will type I'll switch user, so as you. So cp etc password tc password 2 and it returns without any error what do you do when you want to open a certain picture located in your photos folder in your windows environment you basically click on this PC and go to the drive and then maybe click on a couple of folders till you reach the photo you want to open, right? If you notice the path you take from the start till you get to the photo, you see it's like a tree. This idea is similar to the Linux file system. In Linux, we work with files and all files are organized in a file system. The file system is an inverted tree of directories, which we call file system hierarchy. The tree is inverted because the root of it is at the top of the hierarchy and the branches are below the root, as we can see in front of us. The slash directory is the root or the start directory at the top of the file system hierarchy. And from there, you can go to the desired file or directory in just one command by specifying the absolute path, or you can jump to subdirectories exactly like what you do in Windows. That's the relative path. To clarify the difference between absolute path and relative path, let's take the following example using the inverted tree in front of us. If I want to read the content of the file, file one, and I know I'm at the temp directory, 
with an absolute path, I'd run cat slash temp slash directory one slash file one. So I write the complete path of it. Think of it as an address. However, if I want to use the relative path, I'd run cat directory one slash file one. So the start of the path doesn't start with the slash character because it will use the current directory as the start of the path to the file. In this slide, I'd like to list the most important commands to navigate through the file system. PWD for printing the current working directory. LS is used for listing files and directories inside the directory. And many useful options usually come with LS command. We'll see that in the hands-on. CD is for changing directory, meaning accessing the directory that comes as an argument. Also, CD has some nice shortcuts or arguments, like when it's left empty, it goes to the home directory, while when you give it two dots, it goes to the parent directory. Finally, when you give it only one dot, it means to go to the current directory. That may not make sense with CD command, but can be useful with other commands. If you want to know where are we or in which directory you are working in, we can run the command pwd. And we can see we are under home slash dolphin. If we'd like to go to any directory, we can use the command cd stands for change directory. So if we type cd slash, then that will take us to the root directory. Where all other directories start from, and you can see the current working directory changes to slash. Okay. And if we run pwd one more time, we will see we have moved to the root directory. Now, how to list what are the branches or the subdirectories from the root directory? We run ls command. All directories under the slash root, under the root directory, contain a certain type of subdirectories or files. And that represents the file system hierarchy. We will discuss in concept the content and usage of each directory in the, in the last lecture of this section. From the root directory, we can go to any directory like home by running cd slash home, which is the absolute path, or cd home, which is the relative path, and both will do the job because we are at the root directory. So we go to the home directory and then we can do listing again. But this time I want to use ls-l option, which will provide some information regarding the listing, like the permissions, like the user and group ownership and the last modification date. So, and we'll discuss this later in this call. Don't worry. So, at this point, I will go to the Dolphin directory by using the relative path. So, cd dolphin, and I am there. If I want to, to use the absolute path, I'd run cd home slash dolphin. So, you get the idea. Okay. Some useful shortcuts will be cd double dots, which will bring me to the parent directory, or one dot, which means go to the current directory. And this doesn't make sense because with the cd command doesn't make sense. However, it will make sense with the cp command. Also, I can run cd tilde. Okay, and it will get me to the current home directory again. The control home directory of the current user, which is the root. Okay, so the final thing I'd like to highlight here is the magic of using the tab tab. Do you remember the auto completion in Linux? For example, if you go to the root directory, And you want to change the directory, but you don't want to use the command ls. 
you can use tap tap and it will show you all the available options to go to and if you type the letter v and you type one tap it will complete it to var since no other directories start with var with v so if you want to go to sys directory from root and you type s so cd slash s one tap it won't complete right so you know there are other options to use so when you press double taps it will show you all options that start with s so we have s bin we have serve and we have sys so again tap tap is very very useful tool very useful and personally it helped me a lot for many many years working with linux operating system and it would help you a lot if you get the error for no such file or directory to create an empty file we use the touch command to make a directory we use the command make gyre and then we specify the name of the directory to copy a file we use the cp command which takes two arguments the source file and the new file destination path to copy a directory and its content we use the option dash r as in recursively and you specify the directory as first argument and the new directory destination path as the second argument to move a file or a directory it goes the same way at the cp command however if the source and destination path are in the same directory we will rename the source file we'll see that in the hands-on video to remove a file or directory we use the rm command with dash r recursive options in case of directories and dash f in case we want to force it without asking but be careful when you use this command because if it's run in the wrong directory it may remove some important files and i can recall a disruptive incident when a system engineer run the same command at the root directory and the command remove the entire file system and the servers faced complete shutdown so be careful with that hello everyone in this video we are going to play around with files and directories how to create them remove them copy them and move or rename them so let's move to the home directory and we'll go to the dolphin directory to practice this so cd home slash dolphin okay so here we go first thing let's create some empty files and by that we'll use the command touch so i run touch file one and it works it doesn't show me any error so it works and we can verify that the file has been created by running the ls command so here we go i can create multiple files like touch file two file three file four and that would create the other files okay so we have the, the new files also i can use special expression so i can run touch file curly bracket five to nine five double dots nine so it's five to nine and you can see it has created files five six seven eight nine so that's the first special expression we take in this course so that's the case with the files if you want to create directories we will use the command make dire so i will run make dire dolphin dire that's the name of that directory i want to create and by running ls we can see the directory is in blue the dolphin dire it's in blue so that may, means it's a directory also if we want to create a nested directory like dolphin dire 2 like make dire 
dolphin dire2 slash sub d slash sub sub d we need to specify dash p option as in parent and it will create all the subdirectories in one command pretty easy right okay so moving forward let's copy some file to other directories for example i need that file one to be under the dolphin directory. So how I can do that? I can use the command cp. So cp file one and the destination which will be dolphin dire flash. So if I run ls dolphin dire, we can see the file is already there. Run. So if I want to copy the directory dolphin dire under the, for example, temp directory, then I will use the same command cp dolphin dire and slash temp. Okay, but it will give me an error that we need to specify the recursive option. So I run it again. So up arrow and and just dash r and it works it doesn't show me any error so let's clear this okay so we can verify that by listing what's inside the temp and we can see the dolphin diary is there okay very easy let's move to the move command and in fact we can use it in two ways first the common use case is moving the files or directories from a location to another. Like I can move file to here, I can move it to be under the dolphin dire or dolphin dire. Okay, so how can I do this? I can say move file to dolphin dire. Okay. And when I list what's inside the current directory, we don't we no longer see the file too. It's not there. And when we list what's inside the dolphin dire, we can see the file too has been moved. Okay, and the same goes with directory. So you can try that by yourself. Second use case is renaming the file, which means that if I run move file three to the name of the new file so test and we'll list so we can see file three again no longer exists however that file test is has replaced it and if i run move file four home dolphin which is our current working directory test 2 we can see it has been renamed again to test 2 while test 3 file 3 uh, no longer exists if you want to remove a file we will use the command rm and type the file so rm file tap tap and we see we have a bunch of files okay so i will choose 5.5, so rm 5.5, and then it will ask me if I want to remove it. So I press yes, and then it's removed. Okay, in case of directories, we will use the recursive option. So I will run rm r dolphin dire slash and it will ask me if I want to delete each file inside of it and the whole directory. So I press yes and then yes and the last one and the last one. Okay, so it's removed. Dolphin dire no longer exists. The last thing, if I want to remove the entire directory and I don't want to be asked for each file or directory, I will use the dash 
F option with the dash R. So I will run RM dash RF dolphin dire 2. Okay. And it's deleted without any ask. Okay. So be careful when you use the RM dash RF command. Important directories in the Linux file system hierarchy. In the beginning, there is the home directory in which regular users store their files and personal data. Next, we move to the root directory, which is the home directory for the root user. Next, there is the etc directory, and it's an extremely important directory that contains all the configuration files in the system. So whenever you hear a configuration file needs to be modified or something, then you should go to the etc directory. And we have that slash var directory. And it's also a very important directory. And it contains all variable data that persists between reboots. For example, log files that dynamically change in the system will be located inside the slash var directory. And by the way, Whoever works in the technical support or its job is to review the logs in the directory. This directory is the go-to directory for them. Now we talk about slash temp directory, which contains temporary files. And these files, if not modified in several days, will be removed. The slash boot, which contains the files to store the boot process to start the system. Slash run directory, which is responsible for storing the runtime data for processes started since the last boot. Meaning, if we reboot our system, all the data inside the slash run will be removed and will be started from the beginning. So this directory contains the running processes, files, and their content. Slash user directory contains all the installed programs and shared libraries like user commands, system commands, and other customized software. Note that some directories are just links to other subdirectories, like the sbin. It's only a link to the sbin directory under the user directory. The final directory will be the slash dev directory, which contains device files the system uses to access the hardware. Tab completion is one of the most powerful tools in Linux, and it saves a lot of time. Tab completion allows a user to quickly complete commands or file names after they have typed enough at the prompt to make it unique. For example, you are pretty sure that there is a command for changing the password for each user, and this command starts with pass, P-A-S. To ask the prompt for help to get you all choices for command that start with pass, you press double tap. So pass and double tap. And now you can see we only have three options, password, paste, and pass a spender. You see, it's super cool, like an MCQ exam. For now, I know pretty sure that the command password, this is the command I want. I don't need to write all password this way. We can just add an S and press a single tap and it will auto complete it for me because no other commands are starting with pass except for the password command. It also works with options completion. For example, if I type user add, which is a command to create a new user, and we press dash and then tap tap. You can see all options available to use. Moving along with our course and our journey in Linux, the single tab or double tab should be our way to complete the commands or the destination path. To get back to the recently run command, you can use the up arrow and down arrow to navigate through the history of the commands. That would save me some time writing the command all over again if the commands are recent. I can get them by pressing a few up arrows. So it's super easy and super fast. So what if I need to see all the commands I run for this user? 
For this, I can run the history command. And you can see the output of the commands I run with their indexes. Note that you may get different output because I run different commands than you while preparing for this course, so don't worry. Also, we'll learn how to search for a specific keyword in history later in this course. If you want to run a certain command in the history, it's very easy. You just press the bang button and then the number of the command. For example, I'll choose. I'll choose this one, 55. So bang, 55. And you can see it implemented, it run the command number 55 in history output. We talked about the dash dash help option and how it can help us get to know the structure of the command and the available options. But what if, we want more documentation or like an example. The answer is the man command to view the manual pages. System manual pages or man pages are a great source of documentation that is available on the local system and usually is shipped as part of the software packages that are installed in the system. The manual for each command contains a lot of important information regarding the command or the probe, like description, options, examples, bugs, and the author. To look for a command or a configuration file in the manual, you simply hit man-k and the string you are looking for. In this example, I put the password command as a keyword and it brought me all the commands with their brief description that contains the word password. As you can see, there's a number beside each command, which represents the manual section this command or file belong to. And that brings us to the idea of the manual pages. The manual pages consist of eight sections and each section contains information about a particular topic. You can have a quick look at the brief description of each topic to get the whole picture. Last but not least, this is how you navigate through any manual page. From my point of view, practicing these commands in the man will make your life much easier. And these keywords apply on the less command as well. So I highly recommend you get familiar with them. There are other commands, of course, but I gathered the most important ones from my point of view. Think of the manual pages as a huge book or reference, which consists of a few sections and each section has a different content. Each section contains a group of commands with their complete documentation. Whenever you want to refer to the documentation of a random command, like touch, you simply run man touch. So I'll run man touch. And you can see the entire documentation of the touch command. By convention, we say that the touch command is used to create a new file. However, when we read the documentation, we see it's used to update the access time and modification time of the input file of each file to the current time. And if the argument doesn't exist, it's created empty. You can navigate through the manual of the touch command the same way you use with the command list. You can use the arrows up and down to scroll up and down. If you want to jump to the end of the manual, you press Shift G. And if you want to go to the top of the page, you press G. If you want to search for a keyword downward, for example, time, then you press slash and type time. It will highlight all keywords like time and you move between the keywords by pressing N letter till you go to the bottom. If you want to go back or search upwards, you can just press the question mark sign and then type time one more time. 
and use the n again to get to the next word. So I believe it's pretty easy and navigating through the manual is something extremely important if you want to get familiar with how to use the commands and how to search for a specific keyword in a command. Editing files and searching in files. Let's talk about editing files. Editing files is something you need to master while working with Linux because everything in Linux is based on files and inside each file, a bunch of text contains information or settings that impact the system. For example, if you need to modify something in the configuration file in the slash etc directory, you must be able to edit it perfectly. So how can we do it in Linux? We use VI or VIM, I call it VIM, and it's an interactive utility that allows us to do some text editing. There are other tools like Nano, but Vim is the tool we are going to use in this course. VI or VIM, Vim, is almost the same text editor results. However, Vim is an improved version of the VI. Vim is configurable and supports split screen editing, color formatting and highlighting, and I prefer this one. And when you Vim a file, you will access a mode called the command mode. It's a mode responsible for viewing the file and running some commands in the text. From it, you can go to edit mode or visual mode or extended mode. In edit mode, you go there with I or O character and you can write or remove whatever you want. And in visual mode, you can highlight some text exactly like when you select text in Windows with your mouse. The last mode is the extended command mode or exit mode in which you tell the utility what are you going to do after all the editing and modification like saving without changes or quitting after saving without changes and so on always remember that to go to any mode you must pass first by command line as a linux administrator you will need to edit text files to configure your system so let's go first of all let's man them and you can see it's VI improved and a program's text editor. And you can see that we can use it by running Vim and the file with options. So Vim is a configurable text editor. And to view one simple difference between VI and VIM, we can use both to open the file slash etc slash password. For example, VI etc password and you can see it's a configuration file and all the lines are as one block without any coloring and formatting. But when you vim etc password, you can see that each column has a certain color and it has a better view and visibility. This feature, for example, helps the administrator or the developer to write configuration files correctly with minimal human error. This is applied to a pre-configured file. So let's edit this file. However, since this is a very important configuration file, the etc password, I will copy it first and place it under temp. So cp etc password temp. Okay. So here we go. So let's vim this file. So vim temp password. And the first thing that you can see, it has no coloring. So since this is a new file, you need to configure it to get it colored. This is out of the scope of this course. For now, we are in slash temp slash password. And the first thing, we are currently in the command mode. We can move up and down right or left but we can't add anything i'm pressing y or pressing t you can't add anything at the moment however we can run a command to remove one line like the command dd so dd and the line is removed there are many commands to run in the mode but i'll leave it to you to explore through the man or any other reason. 
external search engine. We agree that whenever you vim a file, it automatically gets you to the command mode. If you want to edit this file, you must go to the edit mode by using the letter I. Now we have insert mode. Okay. So, and I can finally edit this file. I can type, hi, this is dolphin base. So I can finally edit it. And to go back to the command mode, we can press escape and it will take us back to the command mode. Another mode that we can go to, which is the visual mode. We can go to this mode by typing V small and you can select multiple characters for text manipulation. You can press shift V. So it's line, entire line. You can select entire line or control V. You can use it for column selection. And after we select the text, we you can use, for example, remove it by clicking on the letter X. So it, it's, it is removed. We can also select the block for copy paste as you, we do in Windows. So for example, shift V, I will copy two lines and I'll press Y for yanked. And then I'll move to the end of the file by shift G and we'll paste it by pressing P and you can see I have pasted the three lines or the two lines I selected at the beginning. So it's pretty easy. And after editing two or three files, I'll be sure you'll master the skill. The final mode is the extended command mode or the exit mode, as I like to call it, in which we tell the utility, what are we going to do with these modifications? So we go there by typing semicolon and then the word W for saving. Now it's saved. And if I want to quit, I'll type Q, semicolon Q, and then I'm out. I can go there again, vim temp password, and apply some modifications. So, hey there, once again, okay. And I can go to exit mode by using escape to the command mode and then to the extended mode, semicolon WQ for saving. And we can also use the bang for overriding the modifications. So here we go. So that's all for Vim. And that's all you need to get this moving with the tools we have discussed in this video. You can master the Vim, master editing files. And of course, if you can read the man or play around with it to discover, you can discover amazing things and you can be fast and effective with them. User and by users, we agree that we have super user, which is the root user, and system user, and normal user. So the root user has full authority to do anything in the system, including system destruction. So as a system administrator, you need to take care of who has the root password, because if an inexperienced user has root access, that may put the system in a vulnerable situation. Of course, we want to avoid that. Using the commands in front of us, we can see how to manage users. I mean, how to create user, delete a user and modify it and so on. Also with the ID command, we can gather some information about the user. So that's how we can manage users and the same applies for the group. So to know any information about any user, we use the command ID. If I type ID without any argument, it takes the current user working on the terminal and you can see we are working as dolphin and i will switch user to root and id one more time and you see we are running as root let's create some users so to create users we use the command user id so i'll create six users so user add Ahmed and we see by running ID okay ID Ahmed so Ahmed takes at the ID 1001 and we'll get to that in a little bit also one more thing whenever a user is created a group with the same name of the user is created automatically so there is a group called Ahmed that is created automatically when we created Ahmed 
So I will create more users. So user add David, user add Maria. And I will run, for example, I'll specify some options just for fun. I can use man or dash help for that. So I'll run user add dash u four 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 four, four Mohammed. And we can verify Muhammad has taken double fours, quad fours. So here we go. Worth mentioning that root user usually takes or always takes the ID zero, while the system users take from one to 999, and other users take from 1000 and above. So we continue adding users with some options. So user add dash C, adding a comment. This is for test, Fernando. Okay, user add dash S has been no login, Sarah. And here I specified that this user shouldn't log into any shell or in other words, it will log in. However, it doesn't, she doesn't have any shell to run any command from. You read more about the options, dash s, dash c, dash u from the manual. Finally, I'll add user add Emily, and here we go. Okay, so if we want to delete any of the newly created users, we will use user del. So user del, Maria and we verify by ID Maria and prompted me Maria no such user. Okay, so same thing. Now I'd like to move to groups. Okay, so it follows the same analogy. So group adds HR. And we'll get to verification in a little bit as the ID command is only limited to users. So again, I can add one more group with an option like U or option like G. So group add the G 4000 as group ID developers. And finally, two groups without options. So group add finance and group add operations and here I want to stop at something extremely important it's time to finally work on the first configuration file and when we say configuration file we think we need to check something in the etc directory right so here we are going to check the etc, the slash etc password file, which we have mentioned a few times earlier in this course. So for user, we can check user information by checking the ID. However, if we want to check the source of it or like where the user information come from, we can view etc password. So I will use Vim. So we can see the users we created. Each one of them takes a line. And this line consists of seven fields. The first one is name. The second is the password, but it's encrypted. Third is user ID. Fourth is primary group ID. Fifth is the comment for this user. We can see the comment we left for Fernando. Okay. And sixth is the home directory. So, so home slash Fernando. So by default, the system creates a directory with the username under the home directory for each user. And whenever a user logins, it gets him to the directory. Finally, the seventh field is the shell type. So with the default option, every user will use the bash shell. 
And you can see here, I specified a different shell with user Sora, which is a shell that doesn't allow any user to run any command like the system uses here. So I will close the Vim for now and just tail the last lines. So tail etc password. And let me first choose a password for David. Okay, so I'll run the command password David. And the password will be dolphin again. And here we go. So if we switch to David from root, there isn't any authentication requested because I'm coming from root. Okay. However, if I come from any external user like Dolphin, it asks for a password. So again, you David. And here we go. And here we logged as in David and we can run bash commands normally. However, if we return to root, so it's you. And then I switch user to Sarah. You will see that this account is currently not available. So I can log in. However, I specify no login shell. So Sarah can't run any command because she doesn't have a shell to run command from. So it tells me this account is currently not available. So we can see slash etc password file and from the man pages man file password we can see good documentation about it if you want to read more however i expect this is more than enough at this point another configuration file we will check together is a slash etc slash group and each line consists of four fields, okay? So first is group name, second is encrypted password, third is numeric group ID, fourth is the user list that belongs to this group. So this is the way we verify groups, pretty easy, right? Next thing, we move to modification. So we use the commands user mod and group mod to like change something with attributes. So user mod dash dash help. And you can see we can change many things regarding the user and same applies with the group. So from the ID of user dolphin, you can see it has primary dolphin ID and secondary Dolphin ID, where is it? Okay, let, let us better write it here. So ID Dolphin. Okay. How can I change primary group for user Dolphin and the secondary group? Okay, so I will use the dash G option here with user mod. So user mod dash G hr dolphin and then if i run id dolphin you see the primary group id has changed from 1000 to 4448 so pretty cool also if i want to add another group for this user so from options, we can use the dash a option, which is for append and dash uppercase G for new list of supplementary groups. And we can see dolphin has primary group ID for HR. So let's, let's run that. So user mod dash a 
G dolphin as a group and then dolphin again and ID dolphin so here we go it belongs to group HR as a primary and it has another group which is off so let's clear and another verification is by checking the etc group vim slash etc slash group and shift g and you can see here that the dolphin has group dolphin let's manage passwords and for managing passwords we use the command change age or we modify the configuration file slash etc slash shadow that contains all password information think of it as a new employee who just got hired first the company creates a new account for him and then he must change his password at first login and then the company may apply a policy when he can when he can't change his password for minimum days or must change the password after maximum days and it may send warning message before his account get locked gets locked and then the account can be expired if it gets locked for a while or when he leaves the company the command change age is used to modify user password information so i can use the manual you can get a very good documentation and guidance on how to specify the values like for example um, the scheme or the format of year month or date okay so i will close the manual and i will use user alia for for this hands-on as a reference so first i will set a password for her so alia and password again Dolphin, again, Dolphin, and here we go. So if I run change age list with dash L Alia with uppercase, you can, s okay, you can see that last password change is today, September 2nd, and you can see the minimum number of days between password change or maximum number of days and so on. So this is the information that we want for user password management. So I will do two modifications just for fun. I will first modify the maximum number of days to be two days. So for that, I will run change age. That's just help for guidance. And we can see that we can use the dash M uppercase option for this. So I'll clear. And then change H dash M capital. Oh yeah. Okay. And here we go. So if I list one more time, you can see that the expiry date will be in two days from today, so September 4th. So you can now see that change has taken place. So one last thing, I want to make this account, Ali account, to be expired and when she logs in it tells her a message that this account has expired so for this i will run or i will use the dash e option so basically change age dash e and the scheme of or the format of the year month and then the user alia okay uppercase
And now if I switch to user dolphin, okay, no, 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 it's now it's root. So I will switch to dolphin. And then I will switch to Aria. And I will type the password. You see the message that your account has expired. Please contact your system administrator and that the user has been, uh, the account has been expired. We may need root privileges for some users to complete some tasks. For example, adding a new user is something limited to root account. And instead of giving the root credentials to a certain user and introducing risk to the environment, we can only allow the user to run this command for user add, right? Hypothetically, if user Mustafa wants to run user add Ahmed as root, he will simply run sudo user add Ahmed and prompt will ask the user to type his password. And if the authentication is successful and user Mustafa is allowed to take this action, the command will be successful. So that is the concept and example of sudo. So how we can manage that, or in other words, configure it. The answer is a configuration file called slash etc slash sudoers. So in this file, we can configure many things like which user can run which command. Also, we can configure it. It should ask about password or not. And the final thing I want to shed some light on is that Anyone who belongs to the wheel group has root privileges to run any command. Before everything, please run these commands for now and we'll get to that later in this section. So change mod 755 slash etc slash do doers. Okay. And one more time with D. Okay. So at first, I will go to user dolphin, so su dolphin, okay? And then I will try to add user. So user add Marcelo. And we see we get access denied. Okay, so again, I will get back to root. Let us have a look at the sudo first. So vim slash etc slash sudoers enter and then we have the configuration file for sudo first thing if i want to have the user dolphin to run anything you can see this line allows people in group wheel to run all commands so all i need to do is add user dolphin to the group wheel and that's it so i close I will add user dolphin to the group wheel. So user mod dash a g capital wheel and dolphin. Okay, and when I run the ID dolphin, okay, we see it's in the group wheel. Okay. Note that you may need to reboot your machine after adding the user to group wheel for the change to take place. So I will reboot. Okay, after rebooting my machine, now I'm working as Dolphin user. And then I'll run sudo user add Marcelo. I will type my password, so dolphin. And you see it works, it returns without any error. And we can verify that by sudo id dolphin. Sorry for that, <laughs> sudo id mar. Let's make Fernando run everything without being added to the wheel group. Or maybe I can do something cool. I can run sudo vim etc sudoers. 
And now I can see at this line, allow root to run any command anywhere. I will just add a new entry for the user Fernando. So I, Fernando, and this means that all equal all specify that on any host that might have this file, the user root can run any command exactly as any user. Okay, so Fernando all equal all and tap all and I'll save. Now we can move to user Fernando. So again, I will exit just to go to, I can switch to root and we'll switch to Fernando. Okay, so now I can run something like sudo find slash etc slash name password and it asks for password for Fernando. I don't recall I have typed a password for Fernando, but let's see. Okay, let's set a password for Fernando. So exit and then password Fernando, quick one, Fernando. So Dolphin. And again, SU Fernando. And let's try the command one more time. So here and Dolphin. And here we go. So it didn't return any error. We want to allow user like David to run a specific command. For example, we need the location or for example, command like user dull. I will go back to root. Let's clear this. So user like David, I want him to run only user dull command. So first I need to specify the location of the command. I will run which user dull. And here we go. So the, this command is actually a file or like a script that is located in user as been user dull. I will edit in the sudo words, so vim etc sudo words, and we'll get back to the end of the file. And then here I'll make another entry for David. So David and all host as any user and we'll specify the command so user user has been user level okay i will quit and save set a password for david at, at the moment again dolphin again dolphin if I switch to David, okay. And try to run command like user mod dash u four nines Maria and press enter. It will ask for password. So dolphin. Okay, so it tells me user David is not allowed to execute user as been like the command as root and local host local domain. However, it can accept the command like sudo user del Maria. Enter. Again, for one final thing. And okay, maybe Maria is not here, so let's try Emily. And it is deleted. 
The last thing I want to try is that I want user Ahmed have full authority without being asked asked for a password every time the user. So I'll exit. Will clear. And then for one final round, Vim etc. Sudward. And then I will go here with Ahmed. I will just copy paste it. Copy paste what's with root. And I will specify. Okay. Uh, I'll specify no password all and I will now after we have modified Ahmed to have um, full access of all commands without password I'll switch user to Ahmed and I will run something like sudo user add Alia and we can see it didn't ask for a password and we didn't need to put or set a new password for user Ahmed. So that's cool. So on the level of permissions, we use a very popular command, which is change mode. And change mod has two different methods. First, very simple one, in which you can add or remove the permissions with plus minus. So basically, if I want to add write permission to the owner, I'd run change mod u plus w and the file and the username of the owner. And if I want to remove execute from the group, I run change mod g minus x. And if I want to apply read to all the user and group and the other, I run a plus r or plus r, both work. And actually I can specify different arguments. So change mod u plus r dash g minus x dash o minus x. That means I will add read permission to user and remove the write permission from group and remove execute from others. Another method for using the change mod is the numerical method. So you specify all permissions for user group and others in a number. Execute x takes 1, write w takes 2, and read r takes 4. And we add the values we want to represent the type of permissions. If I want the user to take read write permission, so we add 4 plus 2 equals 6. And for group, if we want read and execute, we'll add 4 plus 1 equal 5. And for others to take execute, so 1. So the command will be change mod 651 and the file followed by the owner. Those were the methods to use the change mod the command. My personal favorite is the first one. However, some people find the second method is convenient. So feel free to choose the method best for you. Let's practice this. I will carry on on the existing files, my file and my directory. So if I want to add write permission to group to my file, I can use the command change mod g for group plus w my file. And to verify, we see it's changed. So now we have the group, anyone with the group finance can read and write. Let's verify this. Let's add the user Fernando to the finance group. So we'll run user mod dash a g capital finance Fernando. Okay, I'm at user David, so I'll switch to root. Sorry for that. So again, user mod. Okay, and it worked. And then 
if I switch user to Fernando, Fernando, and try to vim the file once again, it used to throw an error. However, for now, I can edit again successfully for one more time. For one more time. Pretty easy and pretty straightforward. Let's practice a few more change mode commands. So if I want to remove some permission, I'll use the symbolic link, a symbolic method. So if I run um, change mod g minus x, so that means, or, or maybe o minus x for others, my directory and ll you can see we have removed the execute from my directory very straightforward actually i can remove execute from all by running um change mod a minus x or minus x both works and the file which is uh, maybe the, my directory would be better and ll and you can see we have changed all execute permissions from user and group and others extremely easy okay the last thing i can specify all permissions at once by using the numerical method so i can run change mod 477 my file Okay, okay, and now I'm at Fernando, so again, I'll go back to root, just to make it work. So change mod 477, my file. And it works, and we can see 7 means read, write, execute, 7 means read, write, execute, and 4 means write, so it is applied. We are going to describe super important concepts that are input output redirection and pipelining. So basically every program or process is triggered by an input to produce output. Like when you run the command echo hello world, the terminal prints hello world, and that's the simplest form. But what happens in the background? To answer this question, we need to describe the process with its channels. So every process has several number channels, 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on. As per the graph, channel 0 is the standard input that triggers the process. In the case of echo, the standard input is the keyboard. Channel 1 is for standard output, which means if the command is going to print something, it's going to be through channel 1, so the output echo goes through channel 1. Channel 2 is for standard error, which means if the command echo was run in the wrong way, the error will be out at channel 2. Channels 3, 4, 5, and so on are configurable, which means that the process has defined a specific output and put it in a custom channel and this channel can be channel 3 for example so now we know that each process has number channels how can we take advantage of that one of the answers is output redirection by default the outputs at channel 1 and 2 are viewed on the screen however if we want to control that or modify the way we save or view the output redirecting the output to a file or the screen or the bin or different terminal and so on ls-l or ll is the command to list the directory with its hidden files and their permissions so if we run it we see that it doesn't have any error and the standard output is viewed on the screen so if i want to save this output to a file we can run it the same way and put the redirection sign, which is the greater than, and specify the file we want to save this output to. So I will type ll greater than test output, 
So you see it no longer prints the output, but instead saves it to the test output. So you get the idea. In this slide, we can see different types of redirection. For example, the basic one is one greater than or greater than is redirect output one to a file. And if it doesn't exist, it will be created and any change will be overridden. If we redirect it twice, like double greater than, that means it will append the changes to the existing files. If we use two greater than, it's the same idea. However, that would be used for the output at channel two, and that's the error. Two greater than slash dev slash null is this guarding the error messages or throwing them to the bin. The last two things are and greater than and double greater than, and they are like the output one and output two will be directed to a file, but the only difference that the double signs are for appending, exactly like the basic one. So let's practice redirection. Okay, so first I'll make directory called hands on redirection and we'll change directly to it, okay? I'll run the command date, which is a simple command, and you can see it has a clear output and there is no error. So this is the standard output at channel one. If we run the command find slash etc name password, it searches for any file with the name password at the directory etc. So I'll run this command. And you can see that we have standard output and standard error. For the errors, we can see permissions denied. So basically this command has an output at channel one and two. One for standard output and channel two is standard error. Let's apply redirection. Let's direct the date command here to a file called current date that doesn't exist. Okay, so date greater than current date. And you can see the output is not printed on the screen because it was redirected to the file current date. And when we cat this file, we can see the output. So what if we repeat the command? We can see that the new data has overridden the old value. So what if we want to add to the file not override it, just to append it? We use the double greater than signs. So date double greater than current date. And you see the new output has been added to the existing file, or we usually call it the output is appended. So let's append the standard error of the find command. So we'll run again the same command. I'll, I'll reach over it by the up arrows. And I'll specify the output at channel two, which is the standard error, double greater than and current date. Okay. And we can see now that only the standard output is printed because by default, the standard output at channel one, it's directed to the terminal. And we can see that the errors are appended to the current date. So cat current date. And here we go. So how can we redirect both the standard output and error to this file and overwrite it? Yes, exactly. We'll use the greater, the and and greater sign as if it directs one and two to this file. So as if it's one and two greater than to the current date. However, we can use the analogy of this one. So find etc name password and enter we 
we can see that the output, the old output, has been removed and the old content has been removed and the new one has been added. In other words, this file has been overridden. We added the channel one output and sent the sender error to the file, and that's it. Let's practice pipelining. If I list the parent directory with their permissions, so I go to the parent directory and ll, and I want to apply different commands to it, to this command. So I will use the pipeline. For example, I can get the last three lines all in one command. How can I do this? I can ll pipeline, the vertical line, then for example, tail dash n three, and here we go. It printed the last three lines, and you can see I haven't specified the file, the argument, because it will get it from the first command. So the standard output of the first process will be pipelined as the standard input to the second process, which is sale. Two important commands, which are find and locate. Sometimes I know the name of the file, however, I'm not able to memorize the full path. That being said, where is it exactly? There are two commands that can solve this problem. The first is find and the second is locate. The find command sometimes can be misleading because it looks easy. I just type find, then I will add a few keywords and then it will make sense and it will bring me all the, the all what I need, okay? However, in our case we use find to get many, many useful information, like locating the absolute path of the file. Let's check this and use find. The correct syntax to use find is typing find, then the directory you want to search in. So for example, I will search in the etc directory, find etc, and then you specify the options, and I will choose name, and then type whatever you want. So it will search inside the etc with the pattern of the file or the directory. Here, not only I can use the name, however, with find I can specify options like users, permissions, and links, and of course you can type manual of find, and you will get the rest of the options. So find has absolutely amazing manual that you can use it as well. For this particular case, I will type find slash etc name then yum and you can see it printed etc yum which is the only directory that has a matching with the pattern I type. So again one more time if I type cron it doesn't return anything however if I type cron d I just print the exact same pattern okay. So this is super useful if I know exactly the, the name of the file and with find I can search inside the directory. There is another way which is my favorite which is the locate command. The locate command searches in a database of all the file path like all the names of the files and directories and basically locate searches for a pattern in this database. So you can use locate and pipeline it with grep and you can narrow down the options that you can see. And that would make you find your file pretty easy and pretty fast. For example, I can locate SE Linux. And then you can see lots of options because it printed out every possible path that includes SE Linux in the file system. So if I grab this with ATC, you can see it limited the output to the output with etc. So now the, the output is less, okay? So now I know that etc se Linux is something I worked in before, so that's the file I would go to. Using locate with grep is very useful and is my personal favorite. However, there is one example that I'd like to demonstrate here, which is if I type touch 
testing locate okay so this file we are in home okay so if i type locate testing locate it returns without any errors or any output why is that that's because the new file is not updated or not inserted in the database of file what do i need to do to update this database i only need to run update db and then i will run again and you can see the file is within the results i will just need to update the database of files and the results will be there we continue talking about common daily tasks of a Linux system administrator, and this task is installing software packages. Sometimes we need to use a certain program, so we download it and install it. The yum commands search numerous repositories for packages and their dependencies, so they may be installed together to fix dependency issues. For the install command, typically searches for the name of the package in the repositories and when it finds it it resolves the package dependency issue and then it installs everything installs it right away all in one step so this is very quick and very powerful and here is an example of common yum commands that we regularly use to install packages so let's use yum simply if you want to download http in yum you just type yum install http and let's analyze what happens So you can see here, it resolves the dependencies by listing each necessary package with its architecture and version and the repository it brought this package from with its size. And now it gives you a summary of total download size and if I'm okay with it, so I press Y. And here we go. It downloaded them. And now it's installing these packages. And now it's verifying these packages. And here we go. Extremely easy and straightforward. There are other options to use with yum. Like I can search for a certain package. So yum search httpd and you can see some packages with their description that contains the name httpd so you choose the package that best suits your need also, I can get some information for the HTTPD package, which is yum info HTTPD. And you can see detailed information like name, version, release, repo url and description so it's quite useful to display more options of yum tap tap would be very useful for you yum tap tap and you can see multiple options to choose from so i will choose REPO list just to know what are the repositories that contain the resources to get 
the package from. So yum repo list. And now we can see three repos available for use. Now the question is how can we control our system to do something? This is by using a very, very important command, which is system CTL. In this slide, I will just provide a few examples of using the systemctl command. First, we can list all the units services by running systemctl list units, and that will give me all the units available in the system, whether it's a service unit, whether it's a socket unit or a path unit. To start a service, we just run systemctl start followed by the service. To check the status of any service, we run systemctl status and then the service. In this example, we can see description, whether it's active or not, the process ID, and we have a few keywords like whether it's active running, active exited, active waiting for something or inactive. And we have enabled, and by the way, enabled concept is very important. When you say that the service is enabled, that means it starts at boot time. Disabled, it means that's not starting at boot time. And this is not only in Linux, but it's known in many, many IT fields. Then the last few logs, when it was run. And if I want to start the service at boot time, I just enable the service to verify whether it's active or not. We run systemctl is active followed by the service again if it's enabled last but not least if i want to edit something in the configuration file of a service that's already running and i want the service to reload the new configuration i will run the systemctl reload service and that will bring updated configuration to the service moving on with command to stop and disable the services it's the same idea one final thing is the unit dependencies I mean, sometimes services are dependent on each other. So whenever you stop a service, it might not be stopped because it's activated by another unit file or another service or whatever. So in order to get the dependencies of each service, we just run systemctl list dependencies followed by the service. And one final thing is masking. If I want any service not to be controlled, meaning I don't want anyone to start it or stop it or enable it or disable it. I can run systemctl mask and the service and that's it. I believe systemctl is very easy and straightforward. So that's it for this lecture. We will use the systemctl to control many, many services in this course, like the cron D. Worth mentioning that it's essential step in troubleshooting. For example, if we have installed an HTTP service to build a web server and it's not working, maybe you can check the service if it's running or not. And if running, you can have a look at the logs of this service. We are going to play around the services using systemctl. Systemctl. First of all, systemctl has amazing double tap completion. So it will guide you to the correct syntax without even going to the manual. All you need to know is to choose which option will help us to do something. So for example, I will select status followed by tap tap. And you can see here we have a huge number of services. Do you really want to list all of them? I will say no. And I will just type HTTPD. And here we can see it's not even installed on the system. So how can we fix this? We need to redownload it first. So I will run yum install dash y http. Now it's downloaded. I will clear first. And then I will run again the same command I just run, which is systemctl status HTTP.service. Here we can see it's loaded and inactive, and there is a reference to the manual page of the HTTPD. So I want to store the HTTPD service, so I will run 
systemctl start httpd the service and it returns without error so that means it runs successfully we'll check the status again and we can see here it's active running okay and here comes the log of the services there are some valuable information like the main process id and the memory for example and so on we have something here to focus on which is the disabled keyword here okay that means that the process will not be started at boot time if we want this process to be run at boot time so that being said we don't want to run systemctl start httpd service each time we start our machine all we need to do is to enable this service so i will run systemctl enable httpd service now the service is enabled and now we can run a few checks to check on this service so i will clear and then we'll run for example if i want to check if this service is active so i will run systemctl is tap tap okay i will choose the is active and then httpd the service and now it tells me it's, it's active if i want to check if it's enabled same idea okay i believe it's very easy to use systemctl and by the way it's going to be an essential part of your daily troubleshooting because you know sometimes when you are performing some tasks you will need to narrow down the possibilities of the calls by checking the services. We always need to check if the service is active or not, enabled or not, maybe check its logs and so on. One more thing is the unit files. Systemd only understands unit files. So how can we find these unit files? Here we go. We will run ls user lib systemd system and I will pipeline the output with this. And here we go. These are the unit files that systemd has access to. These literally controls anything you can do in the system. And we can add or create more unit files just to add some functionality to the system. And systemd will handle this unit file. For example, mounting a file system this has to go through a unit file that systemd has control on and that brings us to the possibility of developing our own services by writing a unit file and this unit file can be responsible to mount a file system beside the fs tab file definitely that can be done however configuring the unit files is not within the scope of this course it's a little bit advanced however feel free to open any of it and just have a look so for example i will run vim user lib systemd system and then httpd the service and you can see this is how the unit file is written we can see the unit description once after documentation service the type the environment and all other parameters so i will close and now uh, using system ctl we can list all unit files by running system ctl list unit files for example i will type um, service and you can see all the unit files created with their state whether it's enabled or or disabled it only limits the services unit files in the output we are going to describe processes their types and states and then we'll apply some process management including listing and monitoring a process is a running instance of a launched and executable program or command which when executed a new instance is automatically created and sorted so basically whenever you run a command any command there is a process that is responsible for it that is created and terminated after the command is run successfully and this process contains information regarding how much allocated memory for it to run information regarding security like ownership and permissions stuff like process id its parent id process state and many many things to consider also there is an environment for each process that includes some local and global variables 
scheduling context and if this process uses some resources like network port, for example. From a system administrator perspective, you only need to know that the process can be configurable to improve system performance. What do you need to know as a system administrator at this point regarding processes? First, you need to know that each process is assigned a process ID called PID and another parent ID called PPID. And that's because each process is created from another process. And if you trace the process, you will go up and up till you reach the process ID 1, which is the first process that created everything. And it's called systemd process. The second thing, each child process inherits security identities, previous and current file descriptors, port and resource privileges, environment variables, and program code. Each process consumes system resources such as memory, CPU, file descriptors, or network ports. Third thing, each process is assigned a state. A process is in one of the following states with their corresponding facts. A process in a running state takes the letter R. From kernel defined state name, it means that the task is running. It's either executing on a CPU or waiting to run. It can be a user command or system call. It can be, it also can be queued and ready in the state. A process can also be sleeping and this can take letters S, D, K, and I. For S, it means task interruptible. So the process is sleeping, but waiting for a certain condition or signal to run. Think of it as a printer that waits for the print command to print your paper. For D, it means task uninterruptible. It's also sleeping, but it doesn't respond to anything, signal. And it's only used with the processes that if were interrupted would cause an issue. For K, it means task killable. It's like the D state. However, it, it was waiting for a signal to be killed. For I, it means task idle, and it's a subset of the D state as well, and used for kernel threads, and it accepts fatal signals. And that's for the sleeping state. Then there is the stopped state, and it takes the letter T, and it's either task stopped, so it was suspended until it goes back to running again, or it's task traced, so the process is debugged. Both states, stopped or traced, takes the letter T. The final state is zombie, and it's either exit zombie, taking the letter Z, when the process gives up all the resources except the PID, or exit dead, when the parent process cleans up all the remaining child processes, and the process is released completely and is never observed in a process listing utility. So how to list running processes? There are two common process listing utilities. One of them is the command ps, which is by default with no options, selects all processes with the same effective user ID as the current user, and which are associated with the name terminal where ps was invoked. However, ps is usually used with common options, AUX or LAX or dash EF. And these options can list things like the process name, the user, the PID, CPU, memory, PPID, and other states. And we'll see this on the hands-on. Also, you can sort the processes based on some criteria. For example, if you want to sort the process based on memory consumption, you can use the dash O option or dash dash sort. Another utility is the top command. It's an interactive utility in which you can view the processes with their details, with options to sort the process or send signal to them. It's pretty handy and very useful. So why listing processes is important? That's because while troubleshooting system performance, you will need to understand the status for some processes. Maybe there is a process that is consuming more resources than expected, or there is a duplicate process that is preventing another process from running and it needs to be killed. Many, many options. The first thing we are going to check 
is the manual of the principal command. And in our case, it will be the command ps that is used for listing the processes. So man ps. And we can see its simple description. It reports a snapshot of the current process and it's only used and with options. Okay, so now there are three types of options. One in which we must not use a dash, one which we must use the dash before options, and the last in which we must use double dashes before the options. So take care of that. And if you scroll down, you can see lots of useful examples. So I'll search with example. And you can see these examples very useful and very easy to follow. And if you search for state, you can see that state flags we talked about in the last lecture. So no need to memorize what each flag represents. So it's very useful. Last but not least in the manual, if you scroll down a little bit, you can see the sorting option that we can use to sort the processes based on certain keys, like this way. This is how we can sort with the sorting option. You can see the PS manual is very useful and I believe it covers all you need as a system administrator. So for now, I'll close the manual. So I'll run PS alone without any options on two terminals. So I will open a new one and adjust them for better visibility. PS alone without options in both terminals. So PS. And here again. Okay. So it displays the processes that associated with the current terminal. The output is as follows. First is the process ID. Second column is the TTY, which is the controlling terminal. And you can see that for terminal one, it takes PTS slash zero. In terminal two, it takes PTS slash one. Third column is the CPU time consumed for each process. And the last column is the command for each process. So pretty easy. Now I will just maximize one terminal to continue working on it. I will start using options and the most common option is the command PS. AUX and by the way dash AUX is exactly AUX however both follow different option styles because dash AUX basically means list all the processes for user X but if user X doesn't exist it will just interpret it as AUX and prints a warning so take care of that and kind of note this can be an advanced interview Linux question so back to our terminal, PS AUX means to list all processes, including processes without a controlling terminal with more column. Press enter. And you can see the output is long. For this, I will pipeline to limit that and just print the first lines using head. So PS AUX head. And here we go. It added columns for process user owner, CPU utilization percentage, memory utilization percentage. The VSZ column displays the amount of virtual memory being consumed by the process. RSS is the actual physical wired in memory that's being used. STAT, which stands for the process state. And the start column shows the date or time for when the process was started. This is different from the CPU time reported by the time column. And finally, the command 
which run this process. So this is how you read the psax command and with grip you can search for a certain command or process. For example, psaux grep bash And now we limited our search or our output that to process our entry that contains the bash. Okay, another option that we can use with processes is with dash, and most common is ps dash ef. So clear ps dash ef, and again with pipeline with head. So the difference is that it shows the parent process ID and C by and by the way C is a rough figure to represent the percentage of the CPU time the process is responsible for consuming S time is the start time and the rest is exactly as the above options. Last but not least, I want to use the last option style, which is preceded by two dashes. Okay. I want this option to be for sorting. And for example, I want to sort the processes based on their virtual memory utilization. Basically, I'll run ps aux dash dash sort dash pmem and I will limit that with head. You can see the processes are sorted according to a percentage of memory. So first memory takes 7.4 percentage, followed by 4.3, 2.2, 1.5. So this is extremely important when you troubleshoot system performance issues. You know which processes take high memory. So maybe this process can be killed or something like that. All right, so we came to the end of the video. Hopefully that was beneficial and you benefited immensely, which was the purpose behind the video. If you like the video, please subscribe to the channel, activate the notification, and also share it so you can support us and you can help us benefit the masses. If you want to know more about Linux, this course is part of an eight and a half hours course that's available on dolphinet.com. And here's the name of the course. And this course has a lot more to know about Linux, including networking on AWS, introduction to bash scripting and scheduling, and a lot more on system tuning and performance, disk management, network file system, and a lot more. So that will be a true deep dive. And if you would like to be in the system administration or in the tuning of systems, if you are in the operation side of cloud, then that definitely is going to be of help. And you'll find the link to the course in the description below. Moreover, this course is actually part of a roadmap that consists of 12 steps, including AWS, Azure, DevOps, and also a lot of hands-on projects. And again, you'll find that in the description below. If Cloud and DevOps is where you are headed and you'd like to achieve up to four certificates in one year, if you spend two hours a day, then this is a roadmap clear carefully designed, all stitched together, logical flow, so you don't have to waste time looking for different courses from different places. And you get access for two years, just in case if you get busy, then you will have enough access, or if you are on the job after interviews, then you can always reference the content again. All right, thank you so much for your time. Hopefully that was beneficial, and I'll see you again in another beneficial cloud DevOps machine learning, artificial intelligence, and a lot more of videos we are planning to publish. Please subscribe and activate the notification so you will get to know when we publish new courses. Thank you so much.